Welcome into football and other F words. My name is Zach Lyons. You can follow me on X slash Twitter at F words pod. He's Mike Herndon. You can follow him on X slash Twitter at Mike Herndon NFL. You can read both of our uh, writings over at paulkaharski.com. Today, um, Mike is detailing how Sneed gives us clues or what to maybe, what to expect from the Denard Wilson defense now that we have a little bit of a clearer picture. Kind of ties in uh, defensive backs helping with uh, defensive pressure and pass rush, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't – it went live, so I'm only paraphrasing what PK said on the radio today. Um, and then uh, tomorrow I'll be writing about how do I think the Tennessee Titans think of the top three wide receivers versus Joe Alt uh, using some information and some data and some historical context. We got a lot to get to today. We're going to talk about Legereus Need. We're going to talk about – um athletic testing jc latham and other things like that and then also we're going to talk about our love for malik neighbors who may be chris olave i think was the last guy that we both universally uh really really loved coming out the draft um wide receiver wise i can't remember was there someone last year that I think we were split last year yeah we were split last year because I was well no 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 we were both on, in on JSN weren't we you were you were oh in yeah it's JSN. JSN that's who yeah, it was yeah. it was JSN yeah we were both in on JSN so we got a new love it's Malik Neighbors and I think there's a good chance that he takes him but we'll get to all that later uh first bluegrass beverages in Hendersonville Tennessee go join their newsletter uh, believe on their website and Seekers Beverages website you should be able to find links and on their Twitter accounts to get into the uh, NFL draft party that we are doing this year. We are doing two NFL draft parties, uh, Friday night and, or Thursday night and Friday night. Friday night is special though. Friday night, we may go live for like five minutes of, you know, putting our inform our thoughts on there on whatever draft picks or moves the Tennessee Titans make on day two or night two, I guess, technically. Um, but it's going to be mainly with a special guest, a sit down, a private sit down, 11 of you are going to be able to sit down and you guys are going for the price of a ticket. You're going to have five bourbon test tastings for the price of the ticket. One of those bourbon tastings that you're going to have is actually more expensive than the ticket. So you're getting bourbon food, expensive, really good bourbon food and special guest in one on one time with me, Braden, and a few others and a special guest where you can ask anything off the record for the Tennessee Titans. So it's going to be some juicy, hot goss sesh. So make sure Bluegrass Beverages, Hendersonville, Tennessee, you join up and buy your tickets there. Mike, let's start off with Legereus Need. Um, I feel like everything's probably been talked about that can be talked about the Legereus Need thing at this point on a Wednesday. But you're, I want to hear your initial reaction because... There are some people out there who thought that the Tennessee the Tennessee Titans are getting are taking too big of a risk, and even with a twenty twenty five third round, some people are concerned about the knees. Some people are concerned about you know what's next about the money. And for everything that we have seen, the money looks pretty reasonable for I think what we both kind of believe is a top five corner, maybe even top three. Yeah, I, and I I view him. As a top five corner, I would say. I think he's right in that range. Um, and the paycheck is right in that range, too, right? It's actually even a little bit low, I think, relative to that. I think he came in, what, tied for sixth or seventh um, in AAV. And then total guarantees, he's right around, like, fourth, I believe. Um, if And that's if the total guarantees that have been reported are actually real once we see the actual contract details, which oftentimes that does not match up um when you see it because it could be guaranteed for uh for injury but not for performance and things like that so how much of those guarantees are actual guarantees um remains to be seen so i i i still think i'm i'm kind of holding my uh <laughs> holding judgment on the contract completely besides the fact that 
I don't see any way that it's going to be a bad contract in my view, unless it's like one of these deals where, you know, the big, the one hold up and the one like potential wet blanket for the LeJerry Sneed thing has nothing to do with the play on the field, has nothing to do with him off the field, has nothing to do with his demeanor, uh, his approach to the game, how smart he is, whether he can fit in the, the defense that the Titans want to run. I think all of that is 100% seamless, enthusiastic yeses as far as uh, him coming to the Titans and being an impact player. Um, the one thing is the knee thing. And, and there's like the rumblings out there about, you know, is it a degenerative issue or, or whatever? And we don't know what it is. It, it's just a thing that popped up heading into the Super Bowl against the Eagles. Uh, so just over a year ago, uh, he pops up on the injury report in preparation for that that Super Bowl. He plays in the Super Bowl, um, and then he goes through the offseason, and he comes in and he misses a bunch of training camp and is kind of dealing with this swelling in his knee throughout the season. Now, I have no idea what the cause of it is. I, I don't think anybody has reported the actual injury or, or what it is. It's just a knee issue and it causes swelling. Um, and for what it's worth, I mean, he's not a guy that's had any serious injury history um, at the NFL level. It's not like he's got multiple torn ACLs or anything like that in his background. So to me, you know, and as Paul Kaharski reported on the site uh, this week, you know, Chad Brinker, Rand Carthon asked around. They did due diligence. It sounded like the trainers for the Chiefs talked to the trainers for the Titans. And then obviously Sneed came in for a physical too. Um, I'm sure they're comfortable with the knee holding up. And look, it's not like it has to hold up until he's 35 years old, right? Like it has to hold up for two years basically <laughs> to make this work. Uh, and then if you get more than that, then that's gravy to be honest. So, like, I, I think this is a home run fit. Um, I think the price that they got, the, the fact that they got them for a 2025 third is a huge deal because you preserve your, your obviously, your picks this year. Um, and I do feel like you can recoup a 2025 third sometime between now and then by trading back or, you know, moving another player or something like that. Um, there's ways to recoup that draft capital between now and then if, if that becomes important to you. but. Um, getting a 27 year old shutdown corner who played shadowed all of the good receivers for the Chiefs uh, last year. So, like, if you in in the article on paulkarski.com, I've got the tweet in there that's got the rundown of all the receivers he faced, and then the numbers he put up against those receivers, like staggering how good he was last year. Uh, I mean, like, basically fifty percent completion percentage for quarterbacks targeting those receivers. Also, I can I say something though? There are a couple of wide receivers in Mike Clay's tweet that I'm yeah, like, man, you yeah. really watered down his accomplishment. He, he, he like unnecessarily reached on a couple of those. Yeah, Romeo Dobbs is in there. No, that was Jerry one of them, Judy, yeah. Josh Palmer. But then like, but the, the other ones like- Josh Palmer was funny. Calvin Ridley, real one. Uh, DJ Moore, Garrett Wilson, Justin Jefferson, uh, Tyreek Hill twice, A.J. Brown, Devontae Adams twice, Stephon Diggs twice, Jamar Chase. Um, those are real legitimate uh, stud receivers. Brandon, Brandon yeah. Ayuk. Um, and he he shadowed all of them. Andy Reid told Paul at, at the uh, NFL you know retreat or whatever that thing is um, this week, you know, hey, he was our lockdown guy. He was the guy we sent after the other team's best receiver. He, I mean, he laid it out as simple as that. So, I, there's there's Chiefs fans out there that will try to tell you Trent McDuffie is actually their best corner. That that is bullshit because they did not treat Trent McDuffie like he was their top corner. They treated Snead like he was, um, and I think he performed like he was too. So they're getting an absolute stud. Like I, I am super excited to watch him play. Um, so now that I've let you like uh, you're obviously super excited to let you talk. I like am a fucking minute straight about fired up about, about it. Yeah. So I want to go back to the injury thing um, because Chad Brinker, for those who do not know uh, or maybe have not paid attention to the, since he's been hired, has gone on and on about this mysterious injury algorithm analytics thing they have working behind the scenes. And he was interviewed by PK and he talked about how you don't have to wait 
to gather information. You don't have to wait for the guy to come in for his physical to gather information on whether a player is healthy or not, or the extent of the injury and all this stuff. It's a very tight knit community, uh, I guess, behind the scenes. And everybody shares kind of information like that in, in the big scheme of things. And obviously Kansas City told, allowed him to get a trade, uh, to go seek a trade. So in turn, in facilitating a trade, you would also hand over, talk about any kind of information that you have as well. So this will be a good test to see, you know, Cheeto uh, was injured as well. So it'll be, it's like a good test to see like, where does this injury, what does this injury algorithm analytics thing do? What does it, you know, actually uh, predict? What does it talk about? So it'll be very interesting to see. I would assume it's like the chances of, you know, you run this much or you practice this much or you do this many snaps or cover this much ground or something like that. Then it's like, okay, this increases your chances here and all that kind of stuff. I'm not worried about him missing training camp practices. If he if he only attends what he did last year, which was he only attended seven of 19 training camp practices. Yeah. Okay, big whoop. I mean, maybe yeah. in a new system and a new team, you kind of want it. But the again, new system he thing is a professional. Me. And and really, he's yes. only been in the league for four years, which kind of is blowing my mind the more I think about it because he is a little bit older, so we kind of have to start – we have – it's going to be that's going to be the case for teams or players looking for a second contract or whatever. In the fact that with NIL, players are traditionally now going to start being older. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, we don't really know anymore because that's going to change the outlook of your age curves and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but in, in the big scheme of things, the Kansas City guys that talked about the knee kind of like talked about the knee as like a kind of like a throwaway concern. Like the way Matt Verderam talked about it on that radio show that got everybody all a tizzy before our episode last week was it was just kind of like, oh, then there's the injury. Oh, then there's the knee issue. It's like it wasn't that big of a deal. And I think that Colts fans and Kansas City fans to cope with themselves are making it a bigger deal now. But you know that they would have been fine with Legereus Sneed coming back and playing 17 games, on, including playoffs, at 100% snap rate. You know, everybody would. And yeah. That's kind of where I'm at on that. Yeah, and I, I I kind of agree. Like, I mean, if he if it was really bad, we would see issues with performance um, or him not being able to stay on the field. That has not been the case at all. So, um, yeah, to me, I, I'm not concerned about it until it causes him to miss games. If that starts to be a, a real issue, then I think that's when the alarm bells go off for me. But as of right now, I, it's not a big concern. It's something to keep in the back of your mind, but it's not you know something to be handling. Well, he's only over. missed three games his whole career, and one yeah. of those he was rested, right? Right. I mean, isn't yeah. that, if, if I'm not mistaken? I think that's um, correct, yeah. PK brought up penalties. Uh, yeah. I he had 18 that in penalties, yeah. uh, six were declined out of that 18, so 12. Those penalty yards cost the, those 12 penalty yards, or sorry, those 12 penalties cost the team 97 yards total. Yeah. So that's eight yards per penalty, if you want to say, because there's five DPIs, three defensive holdings, two illegal use of hands, one unnecessary roughness, and one illegal contact. So it's not all DPI. I mean, obviously DPI with five, you'd like not to have five, but there's other penalties mixed in there that most of them are related to being context. physical. <laughs> yeah. In, in the yeah. which is his calling card, right? Like he is right. extremely physical as a cover corner. So to me, when, it, when you break it down and you're talking about a guy that went from 2020, four penalties, 2021, the four penalties that counted. Okay. Uh, 10 in 2021, Five in 2022, 12 in 2023. So my estimation, based on the data, is that if it went four and five on even years, then in 2024 it should be six. So I think we're okay. Yeah. Six six penalties will count for the Tennessee Titans. And and here's here's the thing too with, with Snead and the penalties. Um, I understand the concern, and you certainly don't want him to commit penalties all the time. When it comes down to it. He guarded those receivers we just talked about just a minute ago, and he gave up an average of 25.3 yards per game on throws into his coverage. He gave up an average of six yards per game in penalties. So we'll tack that on, and we'll say 
He's going to allow Jamar Chase, A.J. Brown, Justin Jefferson, 31 yards per game. Sold. I will take it today. I don't give a shit how many of those yards are penalties versus catches. Um, give me that. Yeah, I'll take it. So I, I think there's some trade off with that. But to me, it comes with the style that he plays, uh, I think, to some degree, because he's ultra physical. And I think that, as I wrote about today on the site, marries perfectly with Denard Wilson's vision for what he wants the Titans to be. And he, every time he's talked publicly since being hired, it's been about attacking defense and not just that, that not just meaning blitzing, but meaning the mindset and meaning the physicality and the fact that they are going to bring the fight to the offense. And if you watched LeJarius <laughs> Sneed play cornerback for even one second, that's the first thing that jumps out to you is like, Oh my God, this guy brings the fight to the receiver every snap like he is a dog uh in coverage and i am so excited to see that and and i think a woozy fits that mold too so like i think between those two and and mccreary who really fits that mold too you've got right from like <laughs> dogs at cornerback now that, that are not going to back down from anybody that are going to play physical aggressive football they're going to contribute and run support they can blitz all three of them can blitz that is a super, super strong point of the Titans roster now. And it's it's going to be a welcome change from what we've seen the last few years with the the kind of more passive uh, corners with Fulton and, and guys like that that have passed through the doors. And even going back to a Dory Jackson and guys like that. Hell, you go back to Jason McCourty, the days. I mean, it's felt like it's been a very, very long time since we've seen here at Tennessee the – Press man coverage shadow Malcolm Butler. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Malcolm Butler Malcolm was Butler's the one. Shadow. Yeah. Well, he was but he was the one who would give you that like physical yeah. press, like in your face kind of thing. And that was but he that also was a choice, right? Like they right. always gave them a choice to do it. And in and, and Butler also that came with a lot of gambling on his part. Um, you know, he just was not a very disciplined player. Um I don't think Sneed has that issue. Sneed is aggressive, but within a disciplined manner. And the same goes for a woozy. So I think that that group is going to be super fun to watch. And I think there's going to be games where those guys just blank out receivers. <laughs> I mean, like, and, and again, as I mentioned in the, the piece too, that's going to help your pass rush. Um, and I, I think you can make an argument that being able to, disrupt timing in the route and make quarterbacks hold the ball longer is more valuable than one guy who can really like destroy um, off the edge, you know? So like you still need that. I, I, I'm not saying you don't need a pass rusher now, but I think that this group is going to help that group so much <laughs> as far as production. That's what I want to get into next, because if you, if you really think about it, I brought this up on a football show is like, isn't everybody's, job or like responsibility a lot simpler right now i mean the way that they have constructed this defense right legere Snead, your job is to cover up the wide receiver one <laughs> you know cheeto your job is to cover up the wide receiver two mccreary just stay in the slot we're not going to move you outside un unless your wide receiver goes with the outside but that's where you're at Amani Hooker, guess what? You don't have to worry about, you know, Sean Murphy Bunting and Christian Fulton, Trey Avery and Eric Gehr, um screwing up the uh, screwing up their assignments or passing off zones. Now you got three guys that can do all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Jeffrey Simmons, you don't have to. I mean, you still want to get there in less than two seconds, but now you don't. Your only wins are not going to come when you can only get there in less than two seconds. Yeah. And with Harold Landry, who will be faster this year, should be better this year. Um, but and Kenneth Murray, it's like see ball, get ball. They still have to have the green dot. But if the, that they are, even though I'm very skeptical with my yeah. expectations for Kenneth Murray, and I think I have every right to be, if they have now surrounded Legarius Need, Cheeto, and and you don't need him to be in pass coverage at this point. You can drop an Elijah Molden, Amani Hooker to cover up. What Kenneth, he could still be there on third down, but he could be there on third down as a pass rusher. Yeah, and, and, and I do think, I mean, he's he's still going to cover some, right? Like, he, he'll still cover some. But I think the, the other part of this is every time Denard Wilson has spoken, 
as I went back and listened to all this stuff to, to write about this in the article, he's also quickly listed Greg Williams and Todd Bowles as his mentors. Um, and he's coached under other defensive coordinators. He's coached under you know, Mike McDonald. Um, he's coached under uh, um, Steichen uh, with the Eagles. So there's there's other guys that he has been under at times. Um, or not Steichen, uh, Gannon. Um, I got my, my uh, former Eagles coordinator switched. Um, but the the two that he goes back to every time are Todd Bowles and Greg Williams. And Todd Bowles and Greg Williams, their calling card, their you know hallmark of their defenses are that they're going to blitz a lot. Uh, I think Todd Bowles still sits around like a 40-something percent blitz rate. Um, and that's on every down, not just third down. So he's going to bring it at all times. And I think if you – Look at Kenneth Murray in the context of, okay, we're going to use him in this way. We're going to send him on the blitz. We're going to try to have him freed up to just chase quarterbacks, chase chase running backs. Like, you don't have to do a ton of thinking. You don't have to have a great feel and coverage for, for your hook, hook curl zone drops. Like, you just go get the ball. I think that makes Kenneth Murray make more sense. I still think it's an overpay. I still think he's not, you know, I'm still concerned about that signing, but it makes more sense why they were attracted to him uh, for that role. Because yeah, I do think he's, he's big, he's strong, he's physical uh, and he's fast. And and to me, it seems like that is all all that they're going after right now is big, strong, physical, and fast. So um it's uh, that's all you can really bank on in the draft for linebacker or safety is big, strong, physical, fast, because I, I caution people. There's very few that have the ability to come in and start right away and be like a pro bowler, all pro or even capable starter. They're all going to have their flaws in some way or another. There are guys that have less flaws for sure. But I mean, that's what you're you're right there. It doesn't matter. Really, where you're looking at on this team, that for once they are saying we want bigger, stronger, faster, and they are giving us bigger, stronger, faster, right? Like that. Yeah. I mean, even Calvin Ridley, Lloyd Cushenberry, bigger, stronger, faster. Like that's just what they're doing. And they're also building from the perimeter, right? We're not used to seeing that. It's been got to win in the trenches, got to build inside out. And, and they're saying, no, because everybody passes the ball and passing is success equals success and stopping the pass also is equally as important as as passing the ball. We are going to build from the perimeter, which is odd considering the way that the Golden State Warriors thing was taken to an extreme by many people. But this is really their building Maybe Golden State Warriors isn't the best example right now, but it really feels like they're building perimeter inside. Is and I I welcome the refreshing change of pace. Yeah, I mean, I I think it makes a lot of sense, and and also if you look at where Denard Wilson has had success, I mean, he's had success with veteran aggressive corners, right? I mean, like in Baltimore, they have Marlon Humphrey, they had uh, uh, Marcus Peters. Um, you know, they've, they've got really talented corners there in Philly. He had Slay and Bradbury. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, even going back to uh, his days with the Rams, I, I remember, um, what was it? He had Jack rabbit uh, on one side and then it was, um, what was the other guy's name? I wanted him on the Titans <laughs> like in 2017. Um, Tremaine, uh, Tremaine uh, Johnson. Tremaine yeah, Johnson. Yeah. And like those guys were physical press corners. Like it, this is his style to a T. So like to me, while, you know, I was critical of them for not wanting to say publicly what the vision was uh, earlier this off season, it is crystal clear now what the vision is and they're executing on the vision with every move that they make. I mean, every move that they make really falls in line with, what they are saying they want to be, which is encouraging. I mean, it's, it's, and it's also nice, you know, I know it, it, Braden thinks it gets overblown, but it's nice to have a coach that will actually say stuff to the media and not treat it like it's the, the nuclear codes. I, I don't like, I don't care at the end of the day. And I said this when Vrabel was here, 
just win games and put out a, a compelling football product. That's your job. Um, the media stuff is like a bonus thing. But if you're going to ask me which one I prefer, I certainly prefer Callahan, who actually will talk about like, yeah, we see Ridley playing the Jamar Chase role in this offense, and and that's how we want to use him. Um, Rabel would have never, ever given up that kind of information or said like, yeah. you know, that this is how we envision him fitting. Uh, you know, it would have been, well, we're going to get him in here and 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 see where he can help the team the best. And, and that would have been all you would have got. So um i enjoy the the new uh coaching staff from that standpoint it's it's much more interesting to hear them talk <laughs> yeah i i think it's just it's very like you said it's very refreshing and everything um you know the what it does do for you for the tennessee titans is it does allow you to still focus on the holes that are on this roster in the draft instead of having to take a high pick for a cornerback. Now you definitely still could, right? Like if Kool-Aid McKinstry falls at 38 and he's the best player on your board, you don't pass it up. I mean, right. There's no reason to really truly pass that up. And on the other flip side of it, you look at day three guys like Jarvis Brownlee Jr., Chris Abrams drain, who have they shown who they're bringing in for top 30 visits? Well, those guys still make sense in round four, round five, wherever it's at. Um, so to me, I'm thinking again, it's kind of like the Calvin Ridley thing. It changes everything about the draft and it changes everything about your approach. And now I kind of feel like this, Mike, and, and this kind of takes us into maybe our Malik neighbors conversation. Maybe it doesn't. We'll see where it goes. But Earlier, when the cornerback hole was gaping, right? It was like a huge hole at cornerback. I'm like, okay, well, you could probably wide receivers out at round two. Well, now that it's filled, I'm like, okay, now wide receivers may be back in play in round two, depending on who's there, if the opportunity is right. But now it feels like wide receiver gets a slight bump above CB in the round two possibilities. I would agree with that. I, I think so. Cause to me, corner, your starters are now set for two years. Yeah. Like minimum. Um, you were going to start Sneed. You were going to start a woozy and you're going to start McCreary for the next two years. Like barring injury, those three are going to be your starters until 2026. Like that's the next time you have an opening in the secondary or in the cornerback room, I should say, because he's you still have an opening at safety. Um, but it's it's not a pressing need, although I will say the fourth cornerback is gonna play, right? Like so I don't think you can completely ignore it and say, well, we'll just put whoever in there. Um it, the fourth corner is going to play. These guys are going to miss time um or you know need to come out of the game for some reason it's unlikely that you're going to see all three of those guys play like 98 percent of snaps um although i'm pretty sure sneed and mccreary and maybe even a woozy played pretty much every snap for their respective teams last year but it, regardless usually the fourth cornerback does see the field so I wouldn't completely scratch it off and, and you know it's also a woozy is is 29 um, so you, you've got to kind of start thinking about having a succession plan in place for a couple years down the road, but it's not, it's not nearly as pressing now. Um, but the other, all the other positions still are, and, and I think wide receiver, and this has been a topic of conversation ever since the Ridley signing wide receiver everyone's saying now well, maybe they don't need a wide receiver no i think they still need a wide receiver because you don't rely anything on burks or phillips um like that's a bonus if one of those guys turns out to be anything for you um and then hopkins he he's probably gone after this year like this is probably hopkins last year in tennessee if i had to guess right like unless he just comes and balls out and is like another thousand yard year and you know, he just so shows zero signs of falling off, despite the fact that he'll be 33 in 2025. Um, that I, I just don't think that he's probably around uh, beyond this next season. Like, do, do you think he's I, like they can't plan for that, anyways? No, no, I look at it like this. So 
I, and this is my opening paragraph to the article at parkarski.com because this is kind of what we're talking about here. The Tennessee Titans are in a better place with their wide receiver room than years prior, maybe even the best, but they're not done. There is a difference between hope and expectation, and the Grand Canyon-sized gap between those two words is how to view Traylon Burks and Kyle Phillips as they both enter year three. That's a good, good paragraph. Hope, yeah, you hope that both – turn things around in various facets of their game, but the Titans should not have the expectation that they will. Neither should fans and neither of those players should preclude you. If the right opportunity presents itself to draft a wide receiver, which brings us into the private workout or private meeting with Malik neighbors, not a surprise. They met with them at the combine, not a surprise. <laughs> Malik neighbors will hopefully measure and we'll, we'll test later today. Uh, he's supposed to do the 40. And obviously the drills, but the general consensus seems to be much like offensive, the discussion around offensive tackle. Yeah. Marvin Harrison jr. Is the cleanest prospect at wide receiver, but that not just because you're the cleanest prospect doesn't necessarily mean you are the best prospect on some teams boards. And I get the sneaking suspicion based on what we know that Rand Carthon, according to Derek Mason on 1025, Rand Carthon, he said he knows that Rand Carthon wanted to save flowers. We know that they have chosen in the Cincinnati Bengals, Jamar Chase over Pene Sewell. We know that Brian Callahan and Rand Carthon have both said they want playmakers. We know that Brian Callahan has said, if all things are created equal, I'm taking the guy that scores touchdowns. So it is a... Good assumption that if it's neighbors and alt at seven sitting there, which is there is a good chance that those two guys are sitting there. That neighbors is not equal with alt because he's higher than alt. And I would venture to say that I think that all things equal neighbors is number one on their board. That's that's even higher than Marvin Harrison Jr. That's kind of where I'm for this particular team. That's where I'm at on Malik Neighbors and his fit with the Tennessee Titans. And I think that at the end of the day, that if it's Neighbors and Alt, I love Alt and I've been team Alt this whole time and I have not wavered. But I've also been under the assumption Neighbors isn't going to be there. So to me, it's I, I'm I'm all in on some Neighbors. Yeah, I am as well. Look, I think for me, and I, I've, and I, I think I mentioned this on the show probably three or four weeks ago. I have toggled back and forth, and I think I finally landed on. I think neighbors to me is the best non-quarterback in the draft. Um, better than Marvin Harrison Jr., better than Joe Alt, um, better than any defensive player. I think he's the best player in the draft um, and maybe the best prospect in the draft period, even above the quarterbacks. I mean, the quarterbacks to me, you have to put in a different discussion because of the value and everything like that. But um, if you look at his profile and his tape come to get, <coughs> excuse me, together, it is a very, very rare talent at receiver that we're talking about his yards per route run his breakout age the fact that he's only 21 years old right now um he is a superstar like if you you don't have to watch him very long to see he has everything and, and i get like marvin harrison is taller and looks more like your traditional like x type receiver right um neighbors is still six foot 200 pounds. It's not like he's a little guy. This is not a Zay Flowers. He probably will come in at 5'11", don't you think? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not going to split. It's not that big of a deal, okay? Like, I'm not saying yeah. that that's a big deal. I'm just, you know, just throwing yeah. that out there. But he is, I mean, we're not talking about a Zay Flowers kind of guy that's like 180 pounds, right? Um, so I, I think that's one thing. But then you do have the explosive plays that he's able to create. You have the run-after catch ability that is – Elite, elite, and that is something that usually translates at the NFL level um, well for receivers. And then you have the body control. Like, he he has top-notch body control, is able to make all the difficult contested catches, despite not being as big of a guy. But, like, it, I, I think body control, to me, over size, makes a much bigger difference in, in whether you're able to make those contested catches. So, to me, Neighbors does everything 
for a wide receiver. He fits beautifully, and I think he's going to create more separation than any than either Adunze or Harrison at the NFL level, just because he is so he has so much juice coming in and out of his breaks that that I just think it's it's a different level with him, and I think he's going to be open and he's going to make a ton of plays at the NFL level. Well, and I also think having Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins also changes the the entire dynamic of even wanting Malik Neighbors, right? Like I, I earlier in the year, I was like, you know, team trade down. I think that I would rather have team trade down because I think I'd rather have Brian Thomas than Malik Neighbors and a couple extra picks. And I may still lean that way, right? Like I may still, in the big scheme of things, lean that way. But Neighbors is a guy that can play inside and out. Calvin Ridley is a guy that can play inside and out. DeAndre Hopkins can play the big slot and outside, obviously. But it also creates just a mismatch problem. Like, a lot of people are projecting that in year three, we finally see that, oh, well, Traylon Burks has been totally misused as a number one wide receiver or potential number one wide receiver. And now he's a number three wide receiver. And you're going backwards, right? Like, now you're having to count on Traylon Burks to be in – a slot guy, yards after catch guy, guy that can catch the ball and you can rely on. When you got Malik Neighbors, who can actually take the different route, right? He can go, I'm a wide receiver one, but I'm a slot guy that can get you the extra yards after catch. You can rely on me to be on my spot, be there quick, and I will catch the ball. And then when DeAndre Hopkins goes, I can move outside. Like, to me, it's like, I think that's the way that you would approach it if you if you were in the room, Right. And everybody's on the everybody's in the room. We know that these discussions get intense, especially in the first overall pick. We know that there's varying opinions because there's different scouts, different uh, assistant manage general managers, and all this stuff with all their opinions. But at the end of the day, I feel like Malik Neighbors is kind of out of the people that will be in the room. Because I, I hate to tell you guys, position uh, coaches are rarely in the room, right? Like you already know what they want. They're they're rarely in a room. Maybe Bill Callahan is an exception, but I I can't remember seeing Bill Callahan unless he was a head coach inside the room. I would assume that neighbors would be the presumptive easy pick at seven. Like I, I don't feel like there's gonna be debate like there was last year between Zay Flowers and Peter Skronsky. Yeah, and and I do kind of also feel like I, I know people want need. Um, they want to draft the need. They want to fix the left tackle spot. And I'm with you. Like, I, I think all things being equal, I would prefer to have the left tackle too just to to get that fixed because I think yeah. it's a hard thing to fix. Um, that being said, I, all things are not equal here. Uh, I think Neighbors is a better player than Joe Ald. I think he's a better prospect. And so when it comes down to it, you're not going to look back in three years and regret, you know, drafting Jamar Chase over like Taylor Decker, like because I've seen that comp for Joe Alt. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with it, but if right. if Joe Alt turns into Taylor Decker, which is one of the outcomes that's possible, he's a good tackle. You you can certainly win with him at left tackle. But if the Lions called up Detroit tomorrow and said, "Hey, we'll give you Taylor Decker for Jamar Chase," they would laugh their ass off, right? Like right. that is. That's the point here. Like you try, you've got to go get the best player that you can. If you're going to be taking somebody at seven, I mean, like this is the spot to go get the the superstar, the guy that like you cannot trade for without giving up multiple ones. Um, and I, I think that's that is Malik Neighbors. It's not Joe Alt, um, despite the fact that I'd be happy with Alt at seven. So I just think that if you're given the choice between the two. Uh, yeah, if all things were equal, I'd go with the tackle, but all things are not equal. I guess it's kind of right. where I come down on it. Yeah, that, that I think that's how they view it, too. Like, I think yeah. you could say that Roma Dune say Joe Walt are probably closer on their board than neighbors and Joe Walt. Yeah. I, I would venture to say that that would be because like, there, are, there are rumblings from Tehran on his uh, um, hit on Jared Stillman last week is like he doesn't feel that Roma Dunze is as high is very high on their board. What what does that mean? We don't really know, right? Like, does that mean he's just a third wide receiver? Does that mean that he is that it's you know he's 
behind Joe Alt or how far behind Joe Alt is he? He could still be ahead of Joe Alt. We don't really know what that means. A very nebulous statement that people have taken to be that they're completely out of room with Dunse, which is unfathomable in my head that they'd be completely out of on room with Dunze. Uh, that, that would be bad GMing. Let me do it. If you are a team that's completely out of room with Dunze, that is bad general managing. Uh, but we don't know what that means, right? So there is a, but the, I do think like, it would be one of those things that would be like, take it to the bank. Malik Neighbors is higher on the draft board than Joe Alt. Would you take that to the bank? I think so. Yeah, I would. I'd, I'd cash that. Um, and, and look, let me also mention regarding Neighbors and Harrison. If Marvin Harrison Jr. was named, you know, Joe, you know, Joe Harrison, um, would he? Would the question of neighbors versus Harrison be as well? No, you can't have him over Harrison. Like, would that would that be the case? Because I don't think it would be. Um, I, I think part of what we're talking about, because like even going back to high school recruiting grades, neighbors carried a, a higher high school recruiting grade than Marvin Harrison Jr. did. Um, and then they go to college, and neighbors outproduced Harrison, um, and. I, I like to me. I just think Neighbors is a better player than Harrison, and if it, his name wasn't Marvin Harrison Jr., we wouldn't be having this conversation because Neighbors would be the clear wide receiver one in this class. So I, I just think that there's some of that 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 needs to be taken into account. That maybe that's that's being filtered into this conversation unfairly. Um, but yeah, to me. I, I think they're going to be head over heels for neighbors. And I think that's why they're taking them for, you know, a private meeting and the pro day. I wouldn't be surprised if we see them come in for a 30 visit, that kind of thing. Um, so I, yeah, I think if he's at seven, he's a probably the pick I, I would, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, and really when you kind of look at their, their advanced metrics, like you look at Malik neighbors, better contested catch rate, right? Higher yards per route run. Yeah. Um, Higher yards per reception versus man. Higher higher yards route run versus man. Uh, he has the better drop percentage, the lower drop percentage. He has the better... Uh, he, he's a little off on yards per reception. It's 18.1 versus 18. But his yards after catch per reception is better. Uh, his reception percentage is better. And uh, then his average depth of targets a little bit lower. So, like, to me, Malik Neighbors um, is, by all accounts, he had a better year last year. And yeah. maybe it's a little bit of the quarterback. I, I, I don't know where people fall on that. But for the most part, even when you talk about EPA, he's better and stuff like that. So, at the end of the day, I do feel like Malik Neighbors is one of those guys where it, it's – I would not be surprised if if he is there and Joe Alt is there, they take Malik Neighbors. I, I think the people who would be surprised or angry or upset, I I think that um they're they're very short sighted in their thinking because I do think there is opportunities in the second round to grab a left tackle or a right tackle because both are equally important. Yeah. And and to still, there's still guys in free agency that can fill in for a year. And I, and I get it. It's all about, gosh, aren't you tired of having a so-and-so guy at left tackle? And yes, yes, I am. <laughs> but I agree. I'm also tired of the wide receiver sucking. Like, to me, that has been the biggest. We had a, a, a good run with Taylor Lewan. And we had a very short run with A.J. Brown. Yeah. Like, we had a lengthy run with Taylor Lewan, short run with A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown was clearly so important to this team's success that we are still talking about, and people still hold that trade over our head. No one's blaming, like, oh, well, crap. I can't believe they let Taylor Lewan retire. No, it's I can't believe A.J. Brown got traded. And exactly. to me, that's, that's kind of where I'm at on that. Um so it, it'll be interesting. That's kind of how I view it. The next thing I want to talk about, because this ties into our Joe Alt conversation, a conversation that we have had many times on this show now. Probably this will be our third straight week, I think, referencing it. But the fact that Joe Alt, in his separation from the rest of the offensive tackles, 
where do you fall on Malik Neighbors? And like, because we've always we've thought that offensive tackle two, offensive tackle three, and offensive tackle four are much closer to offensive tackle one in this draft. Yeah, you've had a couple of weeks to watch more Malik Neighbors to analyze more Malik Neighbors. Obviously, Marvin Harrison Jr., let's just take him out. I think he's too yeah. much of a special case to include. Do you think the gap between Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze is bigger than the gap between Joe Alt and OT2, in your opinion, whoever that may be? For me, it is, yeah. For me, it it, it definitely okay. is. And I and I do love a Dunze. Like, hey, that's the thing. I, it's just that's how highly I think of Neighbors. Um, so, and to me – yeah, neighbors is a very clear gap, and and all like I think it's the best tackle, but I don't think it's nearly as I, like I still go back to like if Fashanu is a hand size had measured differently, would people really be like crapping on him now? Because I feel like that's all being overblown. Because to me, like Fashanu was by all accounts either tackle one or two like in fact he was tackle one for most of the season in most people's mind and then we got towards the end of the season it became like alt or Fashanu. and now it's it's like clearly alt and somehow Fashanu is like you know leftover lasagna or whatever over here so i i, I think Fashanu is still a much better prospect than what the discourse around him has turned into and i don't know if that's just the hand size thing or if it's concerns over like the run blocking or whatever, but honestly, I just don't really give a shit about run blocking. I'm with you. No, I give a shit about run blocking. I, like, give me the guy who can like dance on uh, out at left tackle and lock down uh, that side and protect protect your blind side so you can throw it all over the field. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, I think I think the gap between Alden Fashanu and even Fuanga and and Latham is not that big. And I I will say I've said this um, earlier this week. Amarius Mims, if you could guarantee me his medicals were good, I might have him as my top tackle, to be honest with you. And I know that the sample size is small, but that dude has very rare ability and, and traits. And I think he, there, if he can stay healthy, I think he actually ends up being the best tackle out of this class. Mims is a great example of a player that should not have tested. And this, because to me, he didn't need to test. Like we all knew that he was an athletic freak, right? Going yeah. into the combine, we all knew. And then he goes in and does the dumbass 40, which none, no offensive line, they should just do 10-yard splits or something. I don't even know if that will prevent the injury, but we got to remember, so many injuries yeah. that happened this year after like the first 40 or in the middle of the first 40, don't do that anymore. And, and, and here's why, pff.com, you referenced the article, but it's called Metrics That Matter for the, from the Combine for Offensive Linemen. And they measured in wins above replacement over the first three years of the of the career. Athletic testing does not really mean as much. There are certain things that do, but does not mean as much as what people make it out to be. And before you know, you come at me with a Joe Goodberry whatever tweet that he said um, about Jackson Carmen because this is what he said. Joe, uh, he said. Will the Bengals continue to draft linemen that didn't do athletic testing before the draft? And this is, of course, in response to J.C. Latham, not um, who weighed in his pro days and did not do uh, pro day testing or combine testing. Cedric Ogabue, Billy Price, and Jackson Carmen have me spooked. None of those guys are better prospects or were even considered in the same stratosphere as J.C. Latham. Like, that is the difference. And, and usually about this time, right? Pro Day was uh, a week ago today. So a week ago from Wednesday, March 27th. So March 20th. Usually by that time, you hear rumblings of, of teams or coaches being uneasy or concerned or annoyed about a player of this caliber not doing testing, Right. Um, even with Marvin Harrison Jr., you had people get annoyed and start kind of talking bad about him. maybe that's a little bit of smoke, you know, try to get him knocked down the boards, but you you heard it, right? And but here's the thing in the positional drills at both the combine and at the uh his pro day, he looked terrific. He looked nimble, he looked agile, he looked fast, and guess what? That shows up on tape too. Like at some point. 
and I, you know me, I'm a big analytics guy. I use RES and in, in a lot of the stuff I do and all that kind of stuff. But we have always cautioned RAS is just one piece of the pie. There are some there are some positions that RAS is weighed heavily towards. There are some positions is not weighed heavily from. Like they're for tight end, good, good correlation between success at RAS, success in the league. In offensive tackle, there's not that much. When you look at some of the top guys last year, like Christian Darisol, right? Christian Darisol, no combine, no pro day testing, still went first round. Pretty damn good, Still right? Awesome. Yeah. Larry Tunsil yeah. only did like two things. Um, there were a couple of others, but the the point is the idea that this the analytics. Mm -hmm. If you're going to use the term analytics to say that res or athletic testing matters at the position, <laughs> you're then you're incorrect. It's a piece of the puzzle. You'd like to have someone more uh, athletic. I mean, Trevor Penning is from 2014 to 2024, right? So this year, he is six, or wait a minute, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth most athletic lineman, Trevor Penny. Ezra Cleveland made it into the top 10. Brian Mahalik, if you guys know him, he's in the top 10. Matt Willetsko in the top 10. Tom, Tommy Doyle, Bernard Raymond, you know, Blake Freeland, Mackay Becton, these are not guys. Andre Dillard is on the first page of RAS with a 9.81. It is not a guarantee or indication of sustained long-term success. And people have to understand if you're going to use analytics, actually dive into the analytics. Don't just say something off the cuff because you saw Joe Goodberry say something about Jackson fucking Carmen, Cedric Abugaye, and uh, Billy Price. Like, look, in, in I love Joe Goodberry, but that's not a that's not a take that you need to run with saying that, oh, well, that that means all offensive linemen who do not test suck. Because that's not the case. Yeah, and I, I think that's um the point is that those guys didn't fail because they're bad athletes necessarily. We don't know what kind of athletes they are. They fail because they're not good football players. Um and at the end of the day, it helps to be a good athlete, obviously. I think that goes without saying, but I don't think that there's any concerns with either Mims or, you know, who only ran the 40 because he pulled his hamstring, which I think the concern there is the fact that he pulled his hamstring after being hurt a lot at Georgia. So, like, the injury stuff, to me, real. And that's the reason I probably wouldn't touch him until, like, late in the first round, um, you know, realistically. But – with Latham, I've got no concerns looking at the tape. I'm not looking at the tape to seeing a guy that, like, oh, I don't know if he can move. I, I don't know if he's got enough athletic ability to be able to block on the edge. Don't have that concern. Plus, he's, you know, 6'6 six, six and has 35-inch, you know, pterodactyl arms, which, by the way, when you have that kind of physical size profile, like an Orlando Brown Jr., like a Trent Brown, um, which he's not even, like, as sloppily built as those guys. Cause like, if you look at JC Latham, he looks more like chiseled to me and like a tapered frame, like an athlete frame than Trent Brown or Orla Orlando Brown. Moves. He's got some moves. Yeah. He's got a little bit of that going on, but look, you know, you can't put three forty two just anywhere. You know, it's gotta, it's gotta show up somewhere. But uh, to me, those guys did not test well. Those guys tested horrible. But you know why they win? Because they're extremely strong and they have extremely long arms. So they're able to just envelop these edge rushers and they're quick enough, you know, to get out of their set and, and protect. So to me, like JC Latham, I don't have any concerns on the tape. Uh, I don't have any concerns on his physical profile that I've seen. So, like, I don't feel the need to get number data to back up what my eyes are telling me. I, I would right. feel more concerned if it was like borderline, but I don't even feel like it's borderline. I feel like he clearly crosses the bar of, yes, this guy can play tackle at the NFL level. The only test that has, to me, that you can use to find late round prospects would be the short shuttle, right? Well, that seems to yeah. be a good indicator of long-term success. And then the bench press apparently is a, that's out of all the combine drills okay for offensive tackles bench press has the highest correlation 
to success in the NFL in wins above replacement, which is insane because everybody thinks the bench press is just the stupidest fucking thing ever. But that has the highest correlation. Laramie Tunsil, no 40-yard dash, no, no short shuttle, no broad jump, no RAS. Uh, hold on. Ryan Ramchek, just a bench press. We have Mike McGlinchey, who did just a bench press, vertical broad, no 40-yard dash, no agility testing. We have Rashid uh, Walker from Penn State, did nothing. Um, and I was actually, I think I was looking for Rashawn Slater. I think I had Rashid Walker and Rashawn Slater. Evan Neal, maybe not the best guy to use, but he did nothing and still went in the first round. Uh, Christian Darisol did nothing. Uh, Paris Johnson just did bench and broad jump. Jawan Taylor just did bench. This happens all the time, people. This is not some new thing. And just because you're worried about his weight, and if you're comparing him to Isaiah Wilson and Makai Becton, then you're not watching the tape. And that that yeah, you're yeah. telling on yourself. Yeah. That, that's exactly what you're doing. And that, that's unfortunate that you're telling on yourselves in such a public forum. But if you're comparing him to those two guys just because of athletic, <coughs> athletic data, which, by the way, Becton was elite. Isaiah Wilson was average. He is a better prospect than both. So that right there should tell you athletic testing does not matter as much as what people want to make it out to be. Stable ma metrics matter. If you want to go into analytics, stable metrics matter. If you want to, for, if you want to go and what we've always said, tape matters more than analytics. We've said it over and over again. Tape matters, and there's a good chance, based on what we have seen, Daniel Jeremiah say, Dane Brugler say. Lance Zierlein say, other guys in the field say, J.C. Latham is in the possibility to go in the top 10. So he's not some guaranteed consensus offensive tackle four just because the, guy, the NFL mock draft database has him as OT4, which, by the way, could include a, a big board for me. Like, And right. I'm not a guy that should be making really – you should be taking their big boards to heart or anything – but they can include anybody's big board that makes one on any site. Same with the mock drafts. It's an it's a flawed way to view it using it. It's a it's an easy way. It's kind of like PFF grades. It's an easy thing to grab to kind of reference, but it's not something that you should take to heart as what the team's opinions think. And from what we've heard from team's opinions, Joe Walt, Marvin Harrison Jr. on a lot of boards are not going to be OT one and wide receiver one. One hundred percent. And one of the guys that. Look that I respect more than any, especially when it comes to offensive line evaluation is Lance Zierlein, whose father was an offensive line coach. Um, it, he has JC Latham as his tackle one, and it's not really particularly close when you look at the grades that he has posted on NFL.com. Um, so to me, I, that tells me that, yes, people are going to see this differently. And I, that's true almost across the board. We fall into this thing Every single year, and I feel like we talk about it every single year, that we fall into this thing where it's like, okay, there's this consensus pecking order that it's like Harrison, uh, then then Neighbors, then Adunze, then Thomas. And those have to be your top four in that order, and nobody could even think about switching up one, one over the other, or you're an idiot. Well, how could you possibly think that? Um they, we're doing the same thing with tackle. It's got to be like Alt, and then it's got to be Fuanga, then it's got to be Fashanu, or or vice versa, or whatever. But we get into this idea that like it's all going to be the same. It's going to be viewed the same by every team, and that like just because the Chargers, you know, Jim Harbaugh's out there talking up, you know, offensive line play this morning, which I agree with him. I think it was a great point that he made. But now, now everyone's saying, well, now he's oh he's definitely taking Joe Alt at five who knows? Like, I don't even think Joe Alt necessarily is like a Harbaugh lineman. I think JC Latham is a Harbaugh lineman. I think he fits his mold to a T like, so I could absolutely see JC, JC Latham being the picket five. Like it would not shock me. It would not surprise me one bit. And I, I know some, some people would probably like probably driving off the road, listen to this thing in the car or whatever. So JC Latham at five. But I think that's, that's not teams don't look at it the same. Like in the Titans aren't going to have the same board that the Jaguars are going to have, or that the Rams are going to have, or that the Seahawks are going to have. Like they're all going to have them in different orders because they're all going to prefer different things. 
And these guys are close. Like, these guys are really good tackle prospects. These are guys are really good receiver prospects. So it's going to come down to, like, the order is going to be based on preference, not based on, like, well, this guy is clearly much, much better in, at everything than the other guy. It, it's just not how it works. Fully agree. I mean, at, at some point, people just, guys, you have to understand that at the end of the day, the mock drafts that you see, the consensus big boards that you see, always are wildly different than what really happens. The majority of them are wildly different than what really happens in the NFL draft night, what it happens in the thing. And so just because I look at it this way, I still don't have Latham as he is my personal o OT4. Okay. I still go alt. And I got like Fuaga and I, I go back and forth between Fuaga and Fashionu. And yeah. then it's Latham. Okay. So that, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm personally at. However, I'm, I'm, I would not just for the record, I am Alt, uh, Fashionu, Latham, which is really close between those two. And then Fuanga um, for me out of yeah. the top four. So like to me, it's like, but those all guys are really close. So then you look at, okay, well, different teams have different needs. The the um, You can get a guy that's played right tackle for the last few seasons of college football if you're the Chargers because you have Rashawn Slater. You put him over there, then you got bookend tackles. You got a guy that is a road grader that can, that can do what you want to do, which is, guess what, run the football. And they got that guy right there that can run the football, and he's familiar with right tackle. He's comfortable at right tackle. So I could see why a team would take Latham overall. I do not see why. Oh, man, gosh, he is snoring as loud as hell. Uh, I do no, it's, see. It's, they're working on uh, gutters outside. Oh, gotcha. I do not see why a team like the Tennessee Titans would have any of these guys, except for maybe Fashinu, over alt. So that's just kind of where mm. I'm at. Like, I, different teams have different needs. Different teams view things and have different system fits. So to me, that's where I'm at right there. Is like, I I can I understand that my top four may look wildly different than other top four, but I am under the impression and understand why other teams would have Latham over Alt. Yeah, and and by the way, also the Chargers need a right tackle, and not that you know you couldn't right. flip Alt to to right tackle, but. Latham has already played there and, and has shown he can play there. So that may factor into their, their thinking as well. But um, I also would say, uh, would like to say on the pod, Malik neighbors just jumped 42 inches at the LSU pro day. So there's, there's that. Uh, there's that too. There was also uh, a 129 inch broad. So 10 foot, nine inch broad for you. So yeah. he, he's Both. doing, he was supposedly only going to do the 40, and now he's doing all, everything, which is, man, rest in peace, Roma Dunze as Titans wide receiver one and two-tone blue dude uh, formula because he, he's coming for it. And oh, my Neighbors God. Is coming yeah, for that. yeah. 42 um, inch vertical is absurd. Yeah. I, now, let me say this. Um, there's a lot of I, – I still think Troy Fontenu is in there as well. Fatani yeah, I is agree. In there as well. I, agree. I, I, I think he's got the size that you want, the tenacity that you want. It may not be clean overall, but there's another guy that I really like. Again, all these guys are not that far off from Joe Alt, in my opinion. And I think I think you could do Fuaga at left tackle and be fine because he's got that nastiness that you're looking for from a left tackle. Like Taylor Lewan, when you really think about it, his physical attributes weren't that great, right? I mean, he's got kind of small hands. He's got smaller arms, but he was athletic. And he was kind of a dirty player. I mean, in a good way, like how you want your left tackle to be. So I kind of see a lot of Fawaga to Lawan kind of comparisons in the sense of personality and size and athleticism. So like I'm kind of I'd rather have a mean left tackle than any than a, a day two left tackle, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, the sub sub 34 inch arms and all that. Um which Lawan had as well, although his wingspan, Lawan's wingspan, I think was was pretty strong just because he's six seven. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I honestly feel like there's 
those those five tackles we just mentioned, including Fatana, who I probably should include more in those discussions because I do really like him, and I, I think he checks a lot of boxes better than really the – Fulaga has a, be, be, a longer wingspan, by the way, than Taylor Lewan. Oh, really? Okay, interesting. Um, well, I, I would say – Probably the hand difference because it was he has yeah. ten point one two five hands and uh, Lawan had uh, baby hands. like nine point two five, so it's probably the hands, the fingers yeah. got the weak man yeah. there. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, but yeah, I think Fatanu and, and and even Mims. But like, if you walk away from the draft with one of those five or six guys, I think you feel pretty good about them being able to come in and start right away. Where I run into trouble, and this is like this is part of the neighbors discussion, although I don't think it should dictate the neighbors discussion. Because again, at the end of the day, you need to your sole focus with that first pick needs to be getting the best player that makes the biggest impact on your team. Um, and I I think neighbors is that guy. Um, however, if you get wait to thirty eight to take a tackle, the like day one starting type guys to me are gone. Yeah. Um, you've got, you know, maybe a Jordan Morgan who, you know, and what not... you mean by that is like day, day one guys that need minimal practice. Like there's going to be right. day one guys that are going to have to learn on the job. They're learning yeah. on the job. Day one guys in day in day two, that could start for you day one, but they're going to be growing pains are going to be massive, yeah. which is fine. Sort of, but maybe that's not the best way, but neighbors plus that alleviates a little bit of the growing pains as well yeah i mean you're looking at like the jordan morgan kingsley suamatia uh kieran Amad- amagaji um you know patrick paul the, those kind of guys in that range and like i just i'm not sold on any of them being like a really good day one starter so but again you're not just drafting for 2024. You're not just drafting to maximize this season. You're drafting to maximize the next four or five seasons. So if you think Patrick Paul can be just as good as, uh, you know, say Olu Fashinu uh, long-term, then yeah, I'm, I'm totally fine. Even if it requires a little bit more work to get him there, right? Like I would rather have the rookie struggles but then you have Malik Neighbors and uh, Patrick Paul. Um, then you know you end up with Fashionu, well, we'll probably but like then Josh Washington, Malik Washington. You know, yeah, someone yeah, you that's a little with... bit more specified in their role that doesn't have the flexibility. Because you're likely, yeah. I, I do. Well, I do think the wide receiver is a possibility in round two. I don't think it's likely to happen. Like I think it's yeah. a little bit more improbable at this point. They're going to have to draft defensive players at some point too, which I know goes against our general philosophy of just make the offense uh, great. Um, but they do have to draft some defensive players at some point because I think I think the number was since 2021 they've taken one defensive player in the top 200 in the draft, and that was Roger McCreary. So uh, you probably do need to address that in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I just – I'm ready uh, – I'm ready to see what they do, but like, uh, yeah, the, the next, what, four weeks? What are we, four mm-hmm. weeks from the draft right now, roughly? Um, yeah, so it's the next a month four weeks are going to crawl by, crawl days, by. Yeah. So, oh, it's, yeah, it's, definitely. It's, 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 we're at the point now where like free agency has trickled into like, you're going to get some nothing burger signings every now and then. Uh, you know, maybe the Titans, the, I still think the Titans will sign probably a safety and a tackle at the very minimum. Um, but you know, it's going to be pretty quiet from now into the draft. So I'm, I'm already anxious to see what they do. And we're not even out of March yet. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I like, I like Malik neighbors. I like Joel. The Titans are in just a prime position, not to fuck up yeah. number seven. Like it's all yeah. setting up to where, unless they go and listen, I could be talked to in Dallas Turner. I wouldn't be, I would be very hesitant of it, but I could see the vision of why they would go Dallas Turner. Um, Unless they go like Jordan Morgan, you know, or Jackson Powers Johnson. I think the most probable situations are trade back, not in order, trade back Malik Neighbors, Joe Walt, Roma Dunze, I think are the most logical right there. Yeah. And I think that when you look at it that way, it's a, 
it's a win, 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 win situation, right? I mean, if Malik neighbors and Joe Alter gone and you're quote unquote stuck with Roma Dunze, you bet there's a lot worse players you could be stuck with. If uh, you trade back and then you still pick up like a JC Latham and an, a day two pick and this and that. Okay, sure. I'm in. Let's roll. I think that's a great, great way to build the team. Um, you know, there, I I think J, a good way to describe guys like Olu Fashionu, JC Latham in particular, uh, I don't know if I'd really go this far with Fuaga, but it's something I heard the other day on the athletic football show that they are two guys that are red chip players, which I don't really like the term red chip. I think we need a color between blue and red, but they're red chip players with blue chip traits. And it's up to the team to get the blue chip traits out of them. And I think that's where, like, if you, if you want to deem, and I, and I do Joe Walt, a blue chip prospect, because he's the cleanest prospect. He's the most complete prospect. I'm in, but these other guys are just right there behind him. And that's kind of where I put Dallas Turner. It's kind of where I put JC Latham, Olu, uh, Roma Dunze, I, I go back and forth whether I want to include him as a blue chip or not. But I think I think that you're looking at two blue, a, a bunch of red chip players with blue chip qualities, and that's fine to get. Like that is okay to get with this team. With if you pick up an extra draft capital, if the draft doesn't fall your way, it's not the end of the world. And yeah. to have those kinds of players on your roster still. It's not like it's Joe Walt and everything else is the worst situation and worst possible outcome ever. That's alarmist behavior from people who are unserious. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, let me ask you a question about, since you're a Bama guy, Chris Braswell. Okay. All right. I like Chris Baswell number two. So like I said yesterday, if I, if I could find the, the message I sent out, but I said, I'm becoming increasingly ecstatic with the idea of Joe Walt at w- w- then the first round and Chris yeah. Bat- Braswell in the second. Yeah. I, that's kind of where I, that's, I, that's, with that. I started playing with the mock draft things. Right. And, and I keep, yeah. I keep taking Chris Braswell in the second and, and I mess around with it. You know, if Darius Robinson fell there, I would also be in on that. I, I don't think he's probably making it out of the first round. And then the, uh, the other guy, I think it's a little bit of a reach maybe for him there, but Marshawn Nealon would be the other one that I'm I'm yeah. kind of into for the Titans. I think all those guys fit. Uh, yeah, I'm with you uh, on that because that's where I normally go. I normally go – it's really hard to avoid Chris Braswell. Now, most of the time, Darius Robinson is there, and yeah. sometimes I cheat and take him, but I don't think Darius Robinson is going to be there. So yeah. that's, that's where I kind of struggle. But for realistic purposes – I think that Chris Braswell and Tavondre Sweat are perfectly fine number, uh, really good number 38 picks, even if Sweat's a little bit of a reach. I am not as sold on someone as um, Edger and Cooper at 38, but again, they've created this massive hole, so I would understand it, but I would not think that it's the best use of yeah. resources. But to me, Chris Braswell, Tavondre Sweat seem like the two guys that I kind of, go back and forth the most and it barring an Darius Robinson drop even over wide receivers like Ricky Pearsall, Xavier Leggett, Troy Franklin, those guys, Ladd McConkey, those guys are there. I kind of still think that Chris Braswell is the best choice out of all of those guys too. Yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of where I've been leaning to recently, just because I, I do think they need, they have a bigger needed edge than I think what a lot of people realize or, well, they or even admit. Said it, right? Like they just yeah. said it this week. They said yeah, the, they don't even consider Rashad Weaver, Caleb Murphy as part of that edge room. Apparently, you know, uh, omission. Maybe it's by yeah. accident. But they yeah. said that Arden Key situational, which is cr- yeah. the correct view of it, right? Correct. Yeah. Like now we know. Now we know for sure his best use is situational because yeah. we kind of thought, well, maybe this will be a good chance. His career's on the rise. Maybe this is a good chance for him to be a full-time starter at that position, and he's not. And that's fine. There yeah. is still a role for a situational pass rusher on this team. Yeah. But they they have said they need one or two more. Yeah. There you go. That should tell you everything you need to know about how they view Edge and the position group that's currently on this roster. And, and if you rank the most important positions on an NFL roster, obviously quarterback, we're setting aside from now. for now. We know Levis is going to get his shot. Um we already talked about tackle and wide receiver. The next two positions are corner and edge rusher. 
And, and those are like your premium position. I think you could throw uh, interior defensive linemen in there now, but you know, you have Jeffrey Simmons. You already have like a blue chipper in there. You don't necessarily have to have two. It would be nice, but um, you know, I think edge and corner are the next two. So like I, I, in corner, we already talked about, you don't really need a starter for two years. Um, so it's going to be uh, interesting to see, but like, I think Braswell is, is a name that we should probably keep an eye on there at the top of the second round. And, and I still think like they've got to find more um, picks. Also, let me throw this out there with neighbors. If you take neighbors at seven, you could trade Traylon Burks for a pick, right? Like, I don't know. I don't think you're going to get someone a, will take him, right? a high pick, but you'd get a pick of some sort for him. I think like kind of like a max a fifth round pick, like at max at best. I don't think you're getting fourth. I don't yeah, think you're getting uh, third. I think not. at best you're getting a fifth and that's still fine. A fifth round pick is very valuable in this draft. I don't care what anybody says about the NIL drying up day three. It may dry up the seventh round this year, but who gives a shit? Fifth round is still a really good spot to find quality players of need, whether that is a Jordan McGee out of Temple. Uh, you know, uh, that's where I target linebackers. Fifth yeah. round is where I target linebackers. Or if you yeah. want to go get your like blocking tight end, like Tip Ryman yeah. or somebody like that, like I, I'd be into that uh, at that spot. So that's that's just kind of where I'm at. Um, you know. And let's not, it kind of was looking a little bleak there about the possibility of a trade back because everybody's going to be going to the Chargers or whatever, probably first. And Arizona, you know, Arizona, then the Chargers. I don't think the Giants, maybe people are going to try and trade with them, but I kind of think they want to stick and pick at six, but we'll see. Um, But you got the Saints, you got Denver. They are kind of got situations where they could want players in that top 10 that could trade back trade up i'm kind of all in like you know if you're there in the fifth in in getting those extra picks i'm just not here on this idea that trading back is the end of the world because they get joe walt because there is a reality where joe walt's not that good there is that possibility he is not going to be for sure 100 percent a perennial all pro he could just be his ceiling could just end up being and seeing well, i see a couple pro bowls every year and i'm all right you know I, I'm, I'm like you know i'm a, you know, average yeah. or it could even be he just starts getting injured right i mean like it, there is no there's there's no prospect in any draft that is for sure going to have an elite unstoppable un, undeniable career even andrew luck's career was ended short because of injury now they got some good years on but they didn't get a fucking super bowl right like yeah. at the end of the day injuries happen at the end of the day people don't live up to their expectations at the end of the day all this stuff is is it's a crapshoot but you have to limit your limit your risk and sure ult limits the risk fully agree yeah, I mean, but also we, grabbing two or three players that are slightly below alt sure limits a different set of risk parameters, right? Like now you got three good players where maybe you only had one really great player, right? Yeah. So like at the end of the day, that mitigates risk across the board. Yeah, it's it's definitely spreading your opportunities for hits uh, Ooh, across four point three five unofficial forty, by the way. Oh, 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 oh yes, yes, Malik. Um, I'm telling you, there's a good, there's a good chance that Marvin Harrison Jr. watches on for the Titans at number seven. I, I do not understand this idea that he's not going to not. Be I mean, there he could be there. I, I, I do think it's possible. I mean, look, I, I have talked about why I view neighbors as better than Marvin Harrison Jr. But if you don't think I'd be doing backflips if they got Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, at seven, I would absolutely be over the moon about that too. So I mean. There's a lot of good options. Just because I prefer one over the other doesn't mean I would be <laughs> disappointed uh, right. by any means, right? So, um, yeah, it's very interesting uh, to kind of see how this all all plays out now. But um, yeah, we we don't know. Like, like to your point, we don't we don't know if Joe Walt's going to have a you know want to do donuts on Charlotte Pike and have a crippling lean addish, addiction and mumble rap career. Like, we just don't know what these guys have going on. Yeah. 
That, that's what people just got to understand. We don't we don't know what's going to happen, but it is uh, it is very great. Uh, I'm excited to hear more about what comes out of Malik Neighbors. You know, all the the measurements. Apparently, he is uh, six foot flat, supposedly. Uh, according to Albert Breer, 199 pounds. Uh, we talked about the 42 and a half vertical, the 129 inch broad jump, and now an unofficial 4.35 40 time. Hooey! Talk about a guy that's improving his draft stock by n- right now. That's for sure. But I mean, all this again, all this shows up on tape. That will do it for us. Football and other F words, paulkarski.com, stackinginbox.com. Go to subscribe to both. Uh, make sure that you're getting all the pre draft analysis you can get. Uh, JC Latham will be the film Friday by uh, Stony Keeley this week. So that will be a good one on Friday. So that'd be a good one for everybody to go watch and learn more about uh, the worst uh, tackle prospect in history because he decided not to test. Uh, then go to uh, Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Get you some good, good, high quality liquor, alcohol, beer wine does not matter they have it all thc drinks or cbd drinks whatever you're supposed to like talk about those kind of drinks they got all those there (laughs) and hey guess what even if you are drinking some non-alcoholic beers they got some unique ones over there as well they got everything over bluegrass beverages and make sure make sure to join the bluegrass uh, newsletter to make sure that you go get the link and get you tickets limited tickets are in supply for day two of the event which is the best event in nashville going so that will do it for us He's Mike. I'm Zach. This has been Football and Other Efforts, and you have just been effed.